The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericahealth.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. I'm your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. And today we're speaking with Bruce Laurie and Rick Smith, who are the authors of the best-selling book, Slow Death by Rubber Duck. And we're discussing their latest book, Talks In and Talks Out. Rick Smith is going to join us later. He's stuck in um, elusive Toronto traffic, but we are speaking with Bruce Bruce Laurie presently. Um, So, Bruce, how did you get involved? Well, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks. Good to be here. Um, yeah, how did you get involved in writing about toxins in our environment? Uh, well, I've been basically r- researching and, and working on environmental issues uh, for the last 20 years. And, um, and I guess the, the whole issue of toxic chemicals was one that, you know, bothered me quite a bit because it, in my view, we had a fair bit of evidence showing you know how these chemicals were affecting our health, and um, and and really a lot of my work was kind of at the interface of, you know, doing the research, understanding the problems, and then seeing where the um, you know where governments and and businesses were actually going in terms of getting rid of some of these toxic chemicals, and and I became increasingly concerned that we were doing a very poor job of that in Canada, that we were letting known chemicals and known toxic substances like, you know, things like asbestos and mercury um, in, in everyday products. And, uh, and then I think what really triggered it for Rick and I was the, you know, the relatively recent, you know, only the last kind of couple of decades, uh, literature around endocrine disrupting chemicals and how pervasive they are in all kinds of products. So, um, so Rick and I thought it would be uh, certainly worthwhile to write a book about the subject and try to raise awareness. Um, you know, in the, the jacket of your book, I think it's quite alarming to see that there are over 80,000 chemicals in our environment that are essentially un, unregulated. Yeah, yeah, that's that's correct. So it's, uh, you know, I think most people are a little shocked when they find out that right now there is very little uh, even testing on those chemicals. So of those 80,000 chemicals, like less than 10% would um, have ever really been tested for for health and safety on humans. So the system we have now is we basically, you know, people find, find chemicals or invent new chemical formulations that have certain properties and Someone says, "Oh, that's cool. It makes the pan non-stick, or it makes my clothes repel water, or um, you know, it makes the rubber duck soft. Uh, let's just stick these chemicals in all of these products, and you know, and see what happens." And uh, you know, for us, that was you know really unacceptable. We 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 need to change the way we monitor and regulate these chemicals. Okay, so we have Rick on the line now. We're just going to put him through. Rick, are you there? Yeah, how you doing? Great. Um, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, so, you know, your your guy, the death of your guy, uh, sorry, the title of your guys' book, um, "Slow Death by Rubber Duck." Of course, um, you know, I try to be quite uh, aware in my house, but my my dog's favorite toy is actually a small rubber duck that he carries around in his mouth. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no, do I have to take this away from him? And and I think a lot of people don't think about that. I mean, these are everyday things that, that we're being exposed to. And, um, you know, we assume that 
that things are safe for us, that somebody has regulated these. And so what you're saying is that that's not really the case. No, that's, that's right. I mean, as, as, Bruce, as Bruce just said, um, it's, really, it's really quite incredible the extent to which over the last half century, the, chem- the chemical industry in the United States and around the world has largely been allowed to be regulated. Uh, so whenever we talk about this issue with people, it, it, we, one, of the, one of the reactions we often get is uh, incredulity, right? Uh, disbelieving when, uh, when we tell people that uh, all, all these consumer products that we buy every day, all of these items that, that litter our homes are full of ingredients that have been uh, badly tested for, for human safety, uh, if at all. And, uh, I mean, the rubber duck just sort of epitomizes that problem where up until recently every, uh, you know, lovable, squeaky rubber duck in America would have been full of a chemical called phthalates uh, that's a potent hormone-disrupting chemical uh, that's particularly damaging to the the developing bodies of little boys. Uh, You know, incredible that this icon of childhood – uh, until very recently, what would have been so damaging. So, um, you know, w- what exactly are these chemicals doing to us? You're talking about them as hormone disruptors, but um, what, what's happening? Well, in in most cases, what's happening is that the 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 chem- <clears throat> excuse me the chemicals are are mimicking mimicking hormones in our body, which is why they're called either you know, hormone mimickers or uh, endocrine disruptors. So when our body receives one of these chemicals, particularly as we're developing, so the developing fetus or young children, you know, developing through re- reproduction, um, you know, our body is, is sending uh, messages through our endocrine system in these hormones. And the chemicals that are mimicking the, the hormones basically confuse our body. And so it only takes very small amounts of these hormones in our bodies to, you know, trigger, you know, whether we're male or female or trigger whether we're going to develop in a certain way. And if these, um, uh, if, if our body is basically interrupted with these other external toxic chemicals, it can actually affect how our bodies develop. So it can affect, um, you know, our neurological system, our endocrine system, our thyroid system, um, and that increasingly is leading to the, the the various epidemics that we're seeing right now, whether it's things like cancer or ADHD or um, reproductive problems. Um, you know, it's a very long list, and uh, uh, but it but it's this uh, uh, it, you know intervention of these very minute amounts of chemicals uh, early in life that uh, that are the problem. Well, in your book, I mean, you you bring up that, you know, studies show that even umbilical cords have some of these chemicals. So babies are being exposed even before they're born. And when you're saying how important this is, you know, to us and the, these fetuses are being exposed and they're still developing, what effect is that having? And how does that even happen? Well, well it, turn, it turns out that, um, uh, that human bodies are quite, Absorbent. Uh, and so one of the things we talk about in our two books is, is uh, the extent to which uh, women who are pregnant or uh, trying to get pregnant uh, need to be particularly aware of these chemicals. Um, you know, it, it turns out that there's, you know, as Bruce uh, just outlined, there, it turns out that there's windows of development during our lives where we are more uh, vulnerable to the damaging effects of pollutants uh, of all sorts. So, you know, as an example, it's, it's long been known that kids, the developing bodies of children, uh, are particularly uh, vulnerable to heavy metal pollution, so lead, mercury. Uh, if, if, uh, if kids are exposed to those uh, at, at certain windows of development in their, in their early life, that will then uh, manifest itself as disease later in life, uh, uh, or as problems later in life. So similarly, uh, phthalates, for instance, which are, which is the chemical that keeps uh, rubber duckies uh, pliable, a uh, very common chemical in a lot of uh, personal care products. If uh, if a woman 
is using a moisturizing cream, for instance, with phthalates, that chemical is then absorbed into her bloodstream. Um, and if she's, uh, if she's nursing, uh, that chemical will then wind up in, in her breast milk and, and be absorbed by, by her kid, or if she's pregnant, be passed through the umbilical cord to the developing fetus. So uh, the, the good news is, as we've outlined in our book, that if you can limit your exposure to these chemicals, you can see, including with young moms, you'll see a, a, a decrease of these chemicals in the body in a very rapid period of time. So what products are, are these being found in? Are these just everyday products? Yeah, I mean, these chemicals are in, you know, in virtually everything. I mean, we, we tried to take a look at a range of products, so everything from, you know, nonstick chemicals in frying pans to, uh, as Rick mentioned, phthalates that not only do you find in rubber ducks and vinyl, but um, fill uh, all kinds of personal care products uh, as, a, as a sort of scent enhancer. Um, these are in body creams, in lotions, they're... Uh, Things like triclosan, which is the uh, the antibacterial chemical. I mean, that's we couldn't believe it, seeing it and everything. You know, Rick talked about it in the book in things like from rubber hoses to kids, you know, soap to dish soap. To, like it's just a uh, like like the list literally is endless uh, in terms of the, the the thousands of products that you're going to find these chemicals in. Well, in in your book, um, you know, I, I found it uh, slightly amusing that um, uh, you didn't stop using, you know, the deodorant until you'd actually written that chapter um, <laughs> on, on that. And I, I think that's kind of the way it goes. You're aware of things, but then you really need something to bring your awareness more to those things before you make the changes because you think, oh, it can't be affecting me that much. Yeah, I know exactly. I think, you know, even Rick and I who, you know, we've been working on these issues for years where we're, you know, generally I would say uh, kind of, you know, skeptical about the claims of a lot of these products. But it's not until you start really investigating the, you know, the actual products and digging into what's in them and then looking at what's behind, you know, the chemical and why it's used and the lax, you know, regulations and the lax systems for evaluating the the safety of these chemicals, um, you know, then, it, you know, it, it, you know, for us, it really compelled us to write these books because uh, we knew the average person would be horrified to, to see what it's really like in, in the, the world of, you know, regulating public health. Well, and, and you you talk about doing a little survey, and most people were, you know, buying organic food more because it was helping them, you know, it was making a difference for for what was going on around them, and and I think that also has some, you know, has some controversy around it, um, you know, the pesticides are everywhere, so you're not making much of a difference. Um, can you guys just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, we we have a whole chapter on uh, organic food and pesticides in, in our latest book, uh, Tox In, Tox Out. Um, and, you know, what, what we've tried to do in these two books is create a series of experiments. Um, and w- w- what we've done is tested ourselves and certain volunteers both before and after doing certain activities to see what the impact of those activities are on um on levels of toxic chemicals in in blood and urine. Uh, So in the case of organic food and uh, pesticides, we actually had nine kid volunteers. Uh, We looked at uh, pesticide levels in their urine before and after uh, the experiment. And in one part of the experiment, they ate organic food uh, for a few days. In the next part of the experiment, they ate non-organic food and the punchline is that on those days when they were eating, eating organic food, levels of cancer-causing pesticides fell to almost zero in their, uh, in their urine um, uh, very, very quickly. So clearly the, the primary source of pesticides in our everyday lives is the food that we eat. And organic food, it turns out, uh, in, in most cases, will largely eliminate those pesticides from the body, uh, and that will diminish uh, your... Um, exposure to that very potent uh, family of cancer-causing chemicals. 
Um, you know, not only do I find that the organic food tastes better, but it's good to know that it's limiting our exposure to some of these toxins. Um, we're going to talk more about this after our break. We're speaking today with Bruce Laurie and Rick Smith, who are the author- authors of the best-selling book, Slow Death by Rubber Duck, as well as co-authoring Toxin and Tox Out. We're discussing the toxins in your environment and what you can do to help yourself. And we'll be back shortly. We're making it easier to listen to the Voice America Talk Radio Network live wherever you go on iPhone, BlackBerry, or Android. Download it from the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market. Much of the time, the illnesses that people feel are simply symptoms, and they mask the root cause of what the real health problem is. You can take back control of your own health, starting with Billionaire Healthcare. This program is hosted by Ashley Black. Our program will introduce you to fascia, which is the knowledge of the living matrix. This bit of knowledge can bring you the health secrets that only the rich and famous have known until now. Listen Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health & Wellness. Can grief be good for you? Absolutely. It gets your attention, helping you evaluate your choices and relationships. Your losses define who you are. Tune in each week for Good Grief with host Cheryl Jones. Our show features those who have made incredible transformations by grieving their losses. You'll learn how to find your courage and strength. You'll discover the important things in your life and how to let go of things that are less important. Good Grief airs live Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Pacific Time, 5 p.m. Eastern on Voice America Health & Wellness. Now you don't have to stay linked to your desktop or laptop. Take Voice America on the go and listen anywhere. Get our mobile app for iPhone, BlackBerry, or Android at the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Falling Through the Cracks. I'm your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. And today we're speaking with Bruce Laurie and Rick Smith, who are the co-authors of the best-selling book, Slow Death by Rubber Duck, as well as Toxin and Tox Out. Um, So Bruce and Rick, Rick, shortly before the break, we talked about pesticides and foods and how that affects people. And... um, now, there there was some press on organic food of how it makes no difference. Now, is there a difference between, I know your little, your test showed that there is a difference, but, um, you know, some people say we can't get away from that. So you can just comment on, on that. Yeah, well, there's two things happening. I mean, what you'll sometimes read are studies that try to compare the nutrients in organic food versus non-organic food. And um, and that's really uh, you know re- really not the relevant kind of study to be doing. So if you're growing broccoli and it has a certain amount of potassium in it, it's not going to make a big difference whether it's organic or not organic. It's still broccoli. I mean the the soil is going to make a bigger difference. But what we're looking at are the pest pesticide residues on the food and. Um, you know, from from our research and the people we talk to, the reason most people are buying organic food is because they don't want to consume pesticides, not because they think there's more potassium in the broccoli. So the evidence is very clear that organic food has much lower levels of pesticide on it uh, on 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 them than on uh, non-organic food. Now you'll you'll always get tiny trace amounts because there's pesticides and chemicals. Everywhere in the environment. I mean, we you know we banned DDT 40 years ago, and there's still DDT in the environment. So it's one of the reasons why we have to get these chemicals out of the environment is because they persist. So um, so I think it you know just to be very clear, uh, if you want to reduce levels of pesticides in your body or in your kids, 
you you want to consume as much organic food as possible. Um, I think that's an important first step. Um, and then with the personal personal health products, how does somebody go about changing you know everything they have in their house that potentially has the phthalates in it? Well, well what we tried to do in our in our two books is think through the ways that toxic chemicals can enter the human body and uh, and then propose some easy solutions to to limit further exposure and to get them out. So as, as Bruce says, uh, you know, one of the main ways you can get toxic chemicals in your body is through, through what you eat, and, and being careful to eat more organic food will, uh, will, will reduce those toxic chemicals in your body. Another way that, that you can get chemicals in your body is through the, the products that you apply to your skin every day. And, you know, of course, all the bathroom products that, that people use in many cases are, are specifically designed to be rapidly absorbed through the skin. So we're talking about things like deodorants and shaving products and perfumes and all the cosmetics that, that we use and uh, moisturizing creams. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of these products have problematic ingredients in them like phthalates, like parabens, uh, hormone disrupting chemicals that, uh, that don't do good things once they're absorbed into your body. Um, and one of the things that we look at in the book is, is whether using less toxic, greener brands that don't contain parabens, that don't contain phthalates, whether using those brands will measurably reduce those chemicals in the body. And the answer is yes, that um, through the testing we've done, uh, almost immediately after you, you switch up your brands, you start using moisturizing cream and shampoo and soap without phthalates and parabens, you'll see those chemicals uh, very rapidly decrease in the body. Um, so what you, uh, what you use in the bathroom every morning, it turns out, has a big impact on, uh, on your toxic chemical levels. I think that's really important because I mean we all um, you know are putting moisturizer on and women are putting makeup on and we put things in our hair and and I don't think we're realizing how many things that we even have just on our body, let alone what we're exposed to in our own home or leaving our home that are affecting us in this way. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I mean, that's r- really what we highlight in the book is um, you know often people will when they're doing these research studies, focus on a particular chemical or a particular product. Um, but what, uh, what is rarely done, in fact, it's very, very difficult to do, is to look at what are the combined effects of all of these chemicals in the environment and our exposure to them. So um, I think we actually answered your question of how many different chemicals the average yeah. woman might be exposed to in the morning. I think, was it like 117 or something, Rick? Um, but if you are, yeah, that's, if you are, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's, it's it's well over 100 chemical, individual chemical ingredients in the various cosmetics and shampoos that people use every day. Right, and so you combine what might be your personal health care routine with what you might be breathing in from um, various, uh, you know, say, your overheated Teflon pan when you're having breakfast to getting into your office and all of the blues and fabrics and plastics that are off-gassing around you all day or the chemicals that are, you know, the fire retardants that are inside your computer. Um, like, we're, we're literally just being exposed to hundreds and hundreds of chemicals, and it's impossible to study what that combined effect is on us. And for some people, they have particular chemical sensitivities and uh, are much more prone to, uh, uh, to having a, a, a serious you know, negative health uh, consequence uh, as a result of their exposures. Well, you know, um, I I actually have multiple chemical sensitivities and I can control my environment because it's, you know, I own the clinic and I own the office, but I can't control what people have washed their clothes in when they come and see me or that kind of thing. Sure. And I, you know, I always react when, when they're wearing it. And I think some people, especially if they have those sensitivities, are wondering, you know, should they live in a bubble or, you know, what can they do to protect themselves? And I know you guys did some experiments on detoxing. What was your favorite, you know, that you found the most effective? Bruce, Bruce, Bruce was the one that had the, um, 
unenviable task of uh, trying all these different detox remedies. Uh, take it, take it away, Bruce. <laughs> what, what, what weird, what what weird and wonderful detoxing did you attempt? Well, it's it, it's, um, it's it's always hard to say that my favorite one was uh, sauna. You know, given that I dehydrated myself and passed out. Um, <laughs> But I still do like saunas, and, and of all the things that I look at, I think uh, this combination, which is really important, and you know, I learned the hard way through the experiments, is of consuming a lot of water as part of any detox routine. Um, you know, as I'm sure you know, our bodies are, you know, two thirds or three quarters uh, water, and um, and basically it's it's the water flushing through our body that literally helps eliminate chemicals. Um, what we looked at were, are there things that you can do to enhance the natural processes that our body has uh, to, um, you know, to try to accelerate the elimination? And so it turns out that certain chemicals come out of our body more readily through sweating. So that's the, the benefit of saunas. You're actually, you know, sweating out chemicals, um, you know, through your skin, which, you know, uh, is our, our largest organ. And so in the same way that there's a risk of the chemicals going into our body by rubbing lotions on our skin. We can use our skin to help detox. Um, for people that have serious uh, heavy metal uh, toxicity, uh, chelation is a therapy that uh, uh, is is well proven. It's a little bit more invasive. It involves uh, an IV of a solution circulating through your body that that literally picks up the heavy metals and and um, and you eliminate them in your urine um, and and I guess the other thing we found was that most of the so-called detox treatments that you might buy as a you know a package detox treatment are really nothing more than you know combinations of of vegetables and uh, and water uh, for the most part. And um, and the message there is not that there's anything necessarily wrong with those, uh, and they will detox you in the same way that eating vegetables and drinking water will detox you. So, um, so it's it's really part of a broader lifestyle and behavior uh, uh, approach that is important for people that includes you know eating less meat, less fat, uh, eating more vegetables, uh, drinking a lot of water, and and exercising, and this, and I don't think there's a doctor on the face of the planet that isn't going to tell you that those are the things you should be doing for a basic, healthy lifestyle. Um, well, I I agree. If you remove those toxins from your environment, and then your exposure is um, limited, then um, you know you'll have less to deal with as well. And I found it interesting about your um, that your sauna experience that you started with an hour and then got told to um, to um, you know shorten your time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I was just uh, basically. Uh, Trying to um, maximize the uh, the effects because we were, I mean, part of the challenge for Rick and I in these experiments is we, you know, the, the average person is being exposed to these chemicals over um, long periods of time, you know, po- possibly over a lifetime, and what we're trying to do is compress that and do these experiments over, you know, a few days or or a week or so. So I wanted to maximize the sauna. Uh, uh, experience, which um, led me to kind of overdoing it. Um, I think that's a good lesson, though. Just start it slow, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, a big part of this I, I discovered, and really it was my conclusion on the the actual detox kind of kits, which I don't really, as I say, I don't really buy into. But if what it does is start to get you thinking about what you're putting in your body and and starts to make you think about how your body does detox, then they're useful in that they help get you on that pathway. So, um, uh, you know, as 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 for any of these things, I think the idea uh, is to start you know start small and incrementally build up and you know I know that for a lot of people it can be overwhelming trying to understand all of these products and all of these chemicals and all of the health effects and and so in our books we we uh we write 
sort of a, a clear and easy prescription, giving people simple things that they can do um, and, and do them sequentially as they become more comfortable and more knowledgeable with, uh, um, you know, with what, what fits best for their own lives. Well, and I think also some people, when I talk about this with them, um, they you know, they see how much money it would cost to replace everything that they have in their house. So um, sometimes I'll tell them just do one thing at a time as it runs out. And then over time, you won't have any of that left. No, that, that's exactly right. I mean, what we've tried to do with, the, with this issue, which can be quite overwhelming sometimes. I and mean, if, you, if you think through the implications of, you know, all these toxic chemicals in our daily life, it can get kind of scary. Um, so we've tried to suggest a stepwise approach, uh, a priority approach that we know works because we've actually done these experiments and shown in our own bodies and in those of volunteers that, that it'll decrease the toxic chemicals. You know, as, as another example, uh, the, the odors, uh, the chemical odors that, uh, that people uh, smell on a daily basis can also affect levels of toxic chemicals in the body. You know, we're talking about things like, um, you know, the new car smell, uh, the new shower curtain smell, some of the potent odors from cleaning products. Uh, we actually did one experiment where we showed that uh, uh, using uh, products with lower VOC uh, uh, content, uh, that that will actually decrease um, levels of chemicals in the body and that uh, trying to avoid these off-gassing smells uh, uh, can actually uh, help reduce uh, levels of, of volatile organic uh, chemicals in the body. Uh, as, as one example, that, that you know, to a certain extent, these chemical levels are within people's control, and uh, if they take a few simple steps. Okay, well, we're going to actually take a quick break. Uh, today we're speaking with Bruce Laurie and Rick Smith, who are the authors of the best-selling book, Slow Death by Rubber Duck. And we're, dis- and we're also discussing their other book, Talks In, Talks Out. Um, if you have any questions about the show, you can send us an email at anantacalgary at gmail.com or message us on Facebook or Twitter. We'd love to hear your comments, and we'll be back shortly. Your favorite Voice America Talk Radio Network shows and hosts are in your car, outdoors, and wherever you need them to be. Listen anywhere. Get our mobile app for iPhone, BlackBerry, or Android at the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market. The root causes of disease can be better prevented and cured using an integration of modern medicine and holistic healing techniques. Become educated by tuning in to Generation Regeneration with Sandra Guy Malhotra. Conventional medicine does have its place, but it should not be the only course of action. It's all about regenerating and healing our whole selves through better choices in lifestyle, foods, spiritual connection, and stress management. Tune in every Tuesday at noon Pacific Time, 3 p.m. Eastern on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. Relationship issues? Anxious? Parenting challenges? No more. Learn how to live your best life. Tune into Straight Talk with top psychotherapist, relationship, and anxiety expert, Sandra Reich. In this program, you'll learn how to transform your challenges into effective solutions, whether it's relationships, parenting, anxiety issues, or other life traps that you struggle with. Sandra will show you how to change them and how to live the life of your dreams. Listen every Thursday afternoon at 6 p.m. Eastern Time and 3 p.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. Follow us on Twitter at Voice America TRN. Get the lowdown on guests, new shows, and your favorites. That's Voice America TRN. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. 
Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Falling Through the Cracks. I'm your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. Today, we're speaking with Bruce Laurie and Rick Smith, who are authors of the best-selling book, Slow Death by Rubber Duck, as well as Toxin and Tox Out. And today, we're discussing the toxins in your environment and how you can protect yourself and help yourself. So I know one thing that people often ask is, um, you know, do these toxins cause cancer? Yeah, well, certainly that's, uh, you know, that's one of the big questions that that uh, people have. And I think, you know, it's interesting, uh, as I said at the outset, I started working on this stuff about 20 years ago. And, uh, and, and back then, there were very few doctors who would actually uh, say that there was a, a direct link between chemicals and cancer. Um, and, and, you know, frankly, there wasn't a whole lot of literature on it. And uh, and that's changed dramatically in the last 20 years. And in fact, most uh, I think most medical organizations would now say that you know up to 50% of the cancers that they see are um, uh, attributed to environmental factors, and uh, and and perhaps 50% attributed to genetic factors. And that's probably just the average view. I know there would be some doctors that would say uh, well, we'll say more or less. Um, and then, and then, of course, it depends on on the chemicals. So, as we started out, we, you know, we talked to, talked a bit about the, the endocrine disrupt, disrupting effect of chemicals, um, uh, the uh, the carcinogenic or cancer causing effects, you know, can be quite different for different chemicals, and um, and the one that that uh, I mean, several of them, and Rick can comment on on a few of them, but um, we we did a fair bit of work on pesticides and, and looked at many, many studies that uh, link pesticides to cancer. And, and uh, at least based on my research, uh, the, the evidence is so clear and so obvious that uh, pesticides are, are directly related to cancer that um, it really is, uh, you know, very concerning that we still have so much pesticide use. And, and what's fascinating is that they can actually determine very specific kinds of pesticides causing very specific kinds of cancer. So this isn't just a generic, you know, here's some pesticide and here's some cancer. This is specific to individual types of pesticides leading to very particular cancers. Um, well, this is pretty scary. So if these are linked to cancers and we have studies showing this, why are there, you know, over 80,000 chemicals that are unregulated? Well, well, a lot of the chemicals that we've looked at are, are a post-World War II creation. And uh, it, it's only, I mean, it's just, it's just a fact that, it, that it's just recently the governments have caught up to the chemical industry and tried to impose... Um, uh, safety testing requirements that should have been imposed 50 years ago. Uh, I mean, this is a very, very influential, um, uh, well-heeled industry that's done a very, done a very good job uh, lobbying for its interests over the last few decades. Uh, but you know, as, as Bruce says, uh, you know, the kind of silver lining of our of our books is that uh, not completely. But uh, to a certain extent, uh, people are able to uh, uh, reduce their exposure to these chemicals, including cancer-causing chemicals. It, it's, it's very clear that a woman's lifetime risk of breast cancer is at least partially related to her lifetime exposure to uh, estrogenic chemicals. So to the extent that you can reduce your exposure to uh, hormone-disrupting chemicals like phthalates, uh, like uh, parabens and others in, in personal care products and in other items that you purchase every day, uh, uh, that's just a good idea. And, and doctors' organizations and nurses' organizations are now saying that, and as a consequence, uh, governments are finally getting on board and restricting the use of these chemicals in a way that, uh, that hasn't happened in the past. So um, what more can people do to ask for this to change? Like, well, it's, I think it's really important um, uh, for people to recognize that, you know, there's only so much they can do as individuals, and ultimately it's governments who regulate these chemicals and decide whether or not 
they can be put into the products that we're exposed to. So it can be everything from getting active in you know a local environmental group, a local you know water protection group, health group, breast cancer group. Um, there's a lot of organizations who have a mandate to um, to basically try to uh, uh, pressure governments into doing a better job of uh, of protecting uh, protecting us from these chemicals. And so, you know, we would certainly suggest that for people who are concerned that they find out. Um, and again, they're sometimes they're local community groups, sometimes they're provincial groups, sometimes they're they're national organizations. Um, but there are a lot of good ones out there um, that, uh, you know, groups like Environmental Defense Canada that Rick and I were very active in, or groups like the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, um, who have this, uh, you know, as a core mandate. Um, I think this is, you know, important because, as you said, just a woman being exposed to, I think you said, 127 chemicals in the morning, just getting ready every day, and then we don't know what that effect has on us, and if they're pregnant, they're still exposed to that. Um, you know, I'm surprised there actually hasn't been more awareness um, of this and more change faster. Well, one 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 easy way to think about this is, you know, as Bruce has mentioned, that we need to demand more as citizens of our government. So whether it's state level government or you know fed, the federal government, uh, in fact, governments all all around the world need to be pushed by by voters to get a move on when it comes to better regulating these chemicals, banning certain harmful chemicals. But we also need to uh, think about solutions as consumers, and for the woman who's you know, reaching for that product in the bathroom in the morning. The the good news is that uh, an increasing number of big manufacturers, big retailers, uh, are uh, are getting these toxic chemicals out of their products. So it's whenever you walk into uh, the grocery store, or the the pharmacy these days, you you can find shampoo on the shelf that's uh, that's labeled clearly no phthalates, no parabens. You can find uh, kids kids products that are clearly labeled no BPA. Uh, you can find you know paints and and uh, carpeting that are labeled as low VOC. Uh, and so with a little bit of uh, searching. Um, and, and much easier than it used to be. You can find those greener, less toxic products, and, and using those things on a daily basis will dramatically, measurably reduce these chemicals in your life. So when, if somebody listening, if this is their first time hearing something like this, where would you recommend that they start? Sorry, start in terms of into changing, you know, changing their environment or their life. What should be the first thing that they do? Well, well yeah, you know, using um, either of our our books, you know, as a guide, I think a starting point is to reduce the exposures that you might currently have. So, taking a look at what's around your house, um, you know, the products you're using, and and again, as you know, I was saying earlier, it can feel a bit daunting. But if you realize that there might only be kind of a dozen or so things that you want to be really concerned about, checking labels uh, for those things, and then and then buying products that you know don't include those chemicals. So, I mean, that would be the first step. And then uh, and then a second step would be thinking about you know what you're putting in your body and trying to. To purchase more organic food, and and one of the ways that I get at that you the question you asked about the cost of these things is, if you're eating more organic vegetables and less meat, chances are your overall food budget will go down because meat is so expensive. So, um, if you look at it that way, you might spend a little bit more for your broccoli, but you don't have to buy, you know, a chicken or a steak or something. Um, so more organic food, and uh, I don't know, Rick, do you want to throw? A- Couple more in. Well, the, the what we've tried to do is think through, and, and what what your average consumer can do is think through how these chemicals make it in their bodies. So, in the bathroom, for for products that you apply to your skin, look for products that say no phthalates, no parabens. Uh, in the kitchen, as Bruce says, uh, uh, try to use more organic food and try to use uh, containers in the kitchen that don't contain BPA, which is uh, increasingly labeled. 
um, in uh, when it comes to items around the house. Uh, uh, look for products that, that say low VOC, which means they don't off-gas nasty chemicals as much. Um, and they can check out uh, our website, toxintoxout.com, uh, uh, for, for other specific tips. So you, you've talked about the VOCs a little bit, and we didn't go into a lot of detail. Can you explain what that is? Well, VOC stands for volatile organic uh, compounds or chemicals. And uh, those are the people can think of it as, as uh, like the smelly products that we use on a daily basis. So, so that those off-gassing carpets or sofas uh, uh, when you when you get them home, the um, uh, the smelliness of paints and uh, uh, certain cleaning products. Those those are actually chemicals that uh, that can be absorbed into the body as you inhale them. So the, it's increasingly the case that uh, whether it's paints or whether it's um, carpet underlay, uh, uh, you know, big retailers like IKEA, for instance, uh, are paying attention to these things now, and you you will uh, you will uh, increasingly see low VOC paint. And it's actually labeled as such right in the paint uh, or um, on the uh, on the furniture tag. It will increasingly say low VOC, and that means it's not as smelly. It's not got as many chemicals in it, and uh, it's just better for you generally. So uh, the fact that low VOC products are increasingly available is uh, is really good news and, and really a product of the last few years. No, it's, it's encouraging that it's changing, and I think that comes with the demand, the consumer demand as well, that we do want change, and we Absolutely. do want in our environment to be healthier, especially so you said that these chemicals started after World War II to increase in our environment. So it seemed, you know, it's a fairly new um, thing for us to be exposed so much. And I, we must not understand completely what that's going to be doing to us in generations. That, that's right, and uh, one of the scary things about these chemicals we've been talking about is that there's actually now good evidence of multi-generational effects. Uh, so there was a recent study, for instance, that showed uh, uh, this uh, bisphenol A, BPA, this chemical, until recently very common in kids' products, that, uh, that it can have actually biological effects in, uh, in the developing embryos of, uh, of animals. So... You know, if you think about that in human terms, that might uh, a, a fetus exposed through through mom's umbilical cord uh, exposed today might not manifest a health effect until later in life. That's an effect that we may not see until twenty, thirty years down the line. So, all the more reason why we need to address uh, this problem now. So, is there a, a genetic ability that can affect how people are responding to these chemicals more than, you know, say someone next to them who's not having a reaction? Yeah, well, very much so. I think what I think really uh, that's going to be the the future of uh, you know of medicine and healthcare is starting to understand that different people's genetic makeup um, responds differently to these kinds of exposures. And I think it, you know, it, it helps to explain why, you know, someone can smoke all their life and not get cancer and other people, you know, and a large number of the population uh, will smoke and get cancer. Um, you know, why some kids are uh, having different allergies and other kids aren't. So, it's very clear that our, um, and even now, as you know, as we're starting to see, um, some of the pharmaceutical companies are manufacturing uh, um, treatments for cancer that are based on the genetic makeup of the individual. So we're getting these tailor-made pharmaceutical products. So, um, so without question, that's uh, that's a big part of this, and. And the um, you know you'll hear people refer to kind of gene expression. So it's the extent to which an exposure will trigger uh, a certain gene to behave in a certain way, and that's a combination of you know the the the, the t- kind of chemical, the timing, the quantity, and the individual's genetic makeup. And which is why it's you know some people dismiss this as oh there isn't the evidence or. You know, it's, we can't. You know, it's too complex. Um, but the, the the reality is, it is it is very difficult to 
identify and 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 create really straightforward um, causal linkages to some of these chemicals because there are so many uh, variables that we need to understand. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it tends to go very complicated. Um, so, is there a way that people can get a hold of you if they have any questions? Uh, yeah, I guess um, the best way would be um, uh, would be through our books or. Um, uh, I think you know we're we're fairly easy to locate on the on the internet, and certainly organizations like. Uh, Environmental Defense Canada, you know, have uh, whole outreach programs for people to, um, you know, if they have more information or need to participate. So, uh, environmentaldefense.org. Okay. Right, well, right. I want to well, and in the United States, Environmental Working Group has been doing great, uh, great work on this, and people can look at our website, toxintoxout.org. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank you both for joining me on today's show. It was a great show. Thank you. Um, if, yeah, if, oh, really <laughs> appreciate it. Um, if any of our listeners are interested in this topic, on June 20th, I will also be interviewing Paula Baker Laporte, who's the author of Prescriptions for a Healthy Home. Paula has dedicated her practice as an architect to the precepts of environmentally sound and health enhancing architecture. Next week, I'll be speaking with Dr. James Wilson about adrenal fatigue, so be sure to tune in. If you have any questions about today's show, you can message us on Facebook or Twitter or send us an email at anantacalgary at gmail.com. Thank Thanks for listening and make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week. Thanks again for listening to the preceding program brought to you on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. For more information about our network and to check out additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericahealth.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the preceding program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views.